uh, from 1928. Um, there'd be so many productivity uh, increases leading to wage improvements and uh, commensurate leisure time reductions that people basically won't have to work anymore, or very, very little. And he was so convinced of this argument that a lot of this is about how people should continue to have, say, you know, uh, three hours a day for five days a week or something, 15 hours just to stay sane and not have all sorts of mental, social problems as a result. So he was quite convinced this, this you know, his calculation is right. And it turns out when you look at the figures, productivity growth and the projection, he's been remarkably correct. And we're at the upper end of his calculation range for productivity growth. So what has gone wrong? And it's exactly as you say, it's the, it's the inequality. But it's not that all this effort has been wasted. It has been garnered by some who haven't been working at all for a very long time. Because what this shows is the extreme inequality. What Keynes totally underestimated is that, yes, we're going to have these benefits. Yes, we're going to have productivity growth, GDP growth, um, and total income growth. But he just didn't realize how skewed the system is that a very small percentage, 1%, 2%, would reap almost all those benefits. And actually, people have to work longer, say, in the last uh, decade or two, than, say, in the golden era. If you look at America, very clear data on that. People have to work harder. Uh, both parents have to work and, and, and. So it's the inequality. And what is the mechanism? I think you're also on the right track there. It is the monetary system, it is usury, interest, which is driving the, the destruction of the environment. Um, but just the, the other response I want to make to the um, Scottish government um, um, uh, member of civil service, what we're doing in, in Hampshire is, where we also have uh, very ambitious targets, not as ambitious, I believe, as in Scotland, but um, for carbon emissions reductions, energy efficiency increase, and so on, and I'm part of a project to set up a new bank, Hampshire Investment Bank, um, which cities, councils um, are supporting. And the idea is this bank will invest in these projects and provide the finance. If funding is the problem in the current system, we'll set up a bank and create money. Raj, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Um, so, so, Hillary, I trained as a doctor, so I'm interested in treatments. Um, and. And I'm also reasonably old, and I've been around discussions around redefining GDP and uh, seen what happened with Nicolas Sarkozy's project and, and seen the 1968 movement to, you know, I think they called it then autistic economics then. And, you know, we're good at analysis, definitely. We know that. We're definitely, definitely good at analysis. We're not so good at actions which are geared to have the impact that we want. And I think we need to put the effort that we put into analysis into looking at what we have to do to have impact. That's not a criticism of the analysis. It's just that we need to refocus our analysis to have impact. Because we haven't got a lot of time, right? And, and um, we need to start making links between where the levers are and what we think. So, for example, if you're concerned, which I share your concern about income inequality, you need to know that your pension funds and your insurance companies take a policy position to have no interest in income inequality in companies that they invest in. It's called a disinterest in quantum. It's a technical approach, but it's a policy decision that they have no interest in income inequality. It's viewed as a badge of honor not to be concerned about income inequality in, in the company today. That's a policy that you endorse by your non-engagement, are a non-engagement with it. It's also a policy that which could be changed. There is a campaigning organization called One Society um, which is trying to change it. And we could form alliances with that body. And there are other organizations internationally which are trying to bring income differential back into the corporate governance debate. It's been excluded at a, at a kind of, um, Adam came up with that wonderful word yesterday, cognitive capture, I love it. Um, you know, it, it, it happens at every level. We decided that income inequality wasn't important. It's now become part of the policy of corporate governance and it becomes a, a shibboleth of kind of norms. It doesn't need to be. And actually what's fascinating, and surprise, surprise, the, 
the uh, HR specialists are working out that the greater the income inequality, the less the engagement of the staff in the organization. Well, this is a price, right? But we are not using it as campaigners in relation. So, so hence my challenge to us to kind of think, what do we care about? What are the levers? I love the fact that Scotland's uh, ambitious about it. How much you can protect Scotland in a, an oasis that's uh, coming underwater, I'm not sure, but nevertheless, let's go for it. And one of the things that you can, you can um, do, I think, a, a, an easy win is uh, eco-efficiency on buildings. A huge sink uh, of energy at the moment. The institutional investment system has, a, has a, uh, an agenda there which you could be working with. And there's a project um, called GRESB, which I'll tell you about, where you could leverage the institutional power. And it's huge in Edinburgh. There's no one here from the Edinburgh investment community, as far as I know. But that's a function. Okay, but, but there's a huge missing gap. So I, I want to challenge us to say, think practically as well as, as uh, intellectually. Okay, well, um, that's just we can be a bit um, loose about, you know, the, the tea break. So if we could just use, like, seven minutes to focus on leverage and practicality. And there's you, 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 Mary... The, the concept of leverage and practicality appeals to me a lot. I like to take a systematic approach. You know, lots of businesses now take systems thinking approach and progressively transform the business. No reason why we can't do that with finance. I think the issue is motivation and a mandate. And I think we can tap in to indignation on the very point you were making there on inequality. I mean, Stuart Lansley has recently identified that in 1977, the bottom 60% of wage earners in the UK were earning 40% of national income. By 2008, that dropped to 33%. He was up here three weeks ago telling us he thinks it might now be, might be 32 or 31%. You know, and if GDP is 64% of personal consumption, we've shrunk the engine. And the people that have harnessed the money at the top end are now investing in um, hedge funds and, and commodity speculation that makes things even worse for those at the bottom. So I think there's a, a big indignation thing that, that, that goes on. There's people in the States like Elizabeth Warren identifying that... Uh, middle-class families that had a good lifestyle in 1970, to emulate that now with health doubling in cost, education, housing doubling in cost, two-parent families in, in work having to pay for childcare and an extra car, that they, they've held on to their lifestyle, but they've just doubled their exposure to catastrophe. You know, so I think the, the indignation there is there for us to, to tap into, and I think we have to do that soon. Thank you, Jim. Um, I've got a little example of people as a force for good rather than finance. Um, and it might draw together some of the facets, the political, the personal, the economic that we've been discussing. I work for a charity called Community Energy Scotland. And what we do is help community groups that want to develop their own renewable energy projects. So we're very interested in the idea of energy as a basic commodity that ties together all sorts of social interactions and value. Um, and a lot of the communities uh, that I work with have been compelled to develop these sort of projects because there's no one else to do it for them. Yeah. What Raj was talking about earlier about the finger pointing doesn't work because no one cares. <laughs> so if you're on an island with expensive fuel or if you're in a small Glasgow community with crap insulation, it's up to you to do something about it. So they come together and they take an interest and that's the starting point. And I think that's what frames all these discussions. There can be technical discussions about means and ends, tools, forms of impersonal transferable credit, but there's got to be the will in the first place to engage in that process. Um, and the, the challenge, in my experience, my practical experience is, if you're doing something like a community share offer, who assesses the risk? Who do you trust to do the risk assessment? If you're doing something like a community share offer, what sort of level of return is sufficient to generate investment? And what you're up against is a system of alienation of risk, which is very attractive, a system that can offer compound growth and interest. Very attractive. So how do you overcome that? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name's Andrea. Um, I'm not a specialist, I'm more a generalist. Uh, um, and I see things like the private sector, the banks since the seven, 70s have won the race to capture the government who are supposed to be for the people. And uh, so it's now for the people, um, be it the shareholders. But I don't think that is perhaps the going to be the, the golden bullet to uh, recapture the government to um, act for 
everybody um, if we have governments. And that's what they're supposed to be, be for. I, I'm not a communist. I'm, I'm you know, um, not any any different things like that. But I just, just think um, it can, you should think about it in terms of, um, we should think about it in terms of um, simplistic, because the media and everybody tries to make it in the finance community too hard to understand. And it should be in terms of weighing scales. You've got concentration of power, the finance community, capture the government, the, the weighing scales up here, the people down here, the people need to bring the government back to the people to make the weighing scales a uh, balance again. <laughs> I just want to comment briefly on this puzzle about why the investors don't get stuck in. And I think it's got to do with the problem of the kind of logic of capitalism up against the democratisation of capitalism. I think this is the real problem we've got. Ever since the idea was that everybody could have their little pot of money, everybody could have their pension fund, everybody could have their rising house prices, we've got a system which has brought in far more people than it can sustain as um, rent extractors, as, as it seems. And, and so we, we, a, a political promise was made to people that if they just stuck their money in, it would be all right. And of course, we did get that stock market boom when all the pension funds went in and the endowment mortgages went in. Um, and I think we've, we've, we've forgotten that, in fact, these can't follow a capitalist, a capitalist logic because capitalist logic must have failure in it, creative destruction, the old Schumpeter thing. Um, but what the pension funds and the insurance companies need is permanent growth, security, 25 years of it. And in fact, what they need is government debt, because in the end, they've got nothing to invest in. Uh, that's their last resort, is government debt. So they've got a, an interest in the government maintaining its debt. But, uh, and so in a sense, all these institutions are really not... They, 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 they've been sort of been privatised, but in fact, they're still public institutions because they cannot lose. And in capitalism, you must be able to lose. And so therefore, they, they, Thatcher was totally wrong. You can't have democratisation of capitalism because then you can't follow the capitalist logic. It always used to be you should only invest money you can afford to lose. That was always the rule, wasn't it, about capitalism? People would invest money they could afford to lose. Well, these people can't afford to lose anything. So the system can't work. No, I think that's really... Uh, we're going to have to end. And then one guy just had his hand up consistently. Right up. <laughs> okay. And so I'm uh, going to have to end it there. But um, maybe two. It could be both one minute each. Hey, Mary, can you just pass the mic? Yeah, two very quick points. One, uh, one. one. okay. <laughs> um, state capture is nothing new. The limited liability company was invented to operate on the benefit of the community. The, the benefits to the community have been systematically removed from the legislation, leaving the limited liability company as being only entitled to act in the interests of its shareholders. And that was one of the earliest state capture things. The other thing is we are not in the control of governments. We're in the control of an international monetary system that creates vast international regulation through the WTO, through the IMF, the creation of vast amounts of fictional money, which is lent to governments throughout the world and forces those governments to impose policies that destroy the lives and livelihoods of billions of people all over the world. Um, I, I speak as a former investment manager now working for an NGO um, and um, I think uh, in reply to you Raj that, that the industry, the pension fund industry and the big institutional holders are getting better, they're being held to account by as you say the likes of YSS, um, PIAC and um, other organizations that tell them how to vote and their own corporate governance teams. I agree individuals need to get involved as well, but writing and saying to company X, you're bad, isn't going to work. And what is needed and what we should be pushing for is transparency from companies. And that is getting better, but it's very slow. So we can't see the inequality of incomes because companies have not, they've just said X number directors earn Y amount and it's not broken down and nor are the risk policies and, and environmental awareness. That's all changing. But that means not being fobbed off when a company says, tick this box, we'll just send you a little tiny pamphlet about what we've done in the year. Um, if you really want to engage, really want to understand, really want to involve and ask intelligent questions, get the full document, read it through, and, and then 
respond um, with something that's hard hitting. Okay, well, hard hitting is a good note which to stop, I'm afraid. Um, but I think this discussion has shown that we really must um, be organising further discussions of this kind that feed into the kind of strategic action that all of you have pointed to. So Robbie, it's Robbie isn't it? yep, yep. has been writing notes, which I hope will then Several go out to everybody. Yeah. And then hopefully, you know, I don't know if the organisation that organises this will repeat, that will repeat, but move on. But I'm sure that there are enough people here who are networked and can be thinking of how to take some stuff forward. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to the. Oh, um, I just want. It, it, it comes a little bit together with this uh, accounting on on like uh, climate change, and I just want to say there are some. Uh, research has done um, for example in France they have a they, they work together on this for one year with friend of the earth France with um, uh, with Caisse d'Epargne a middle big bank in, in France where they uh, they uh, develop methodolo methodology to really calculate all the financed emissions and this is really this is a really useful tool because uh, with this they, they can really show like a bank this bank uh, uh, finances their listed uh, coal, oil, and gas companies and says, if we want to stay within the two degrees uh, climate warming uh, uh, scheme, then 80% of all the stock listed uh, uh, companies, cannot, cannot, uh, their, their reserves cannot be burned. And this is, well, I had some meeting with banks and then this was like the only argument that they were in some, some way afraid of. You know. Just come back to Victoria and um, Richard. And then, I mean, I wonder if we could move on to some of the issues that Raj raised about the role of pension funds. And Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not as naive as you make out. I mean, I do know that the state is captured now, but I, I, my perspective starts at the end of the, of the golden era in 1971. And uh, it's less obvious from the internal material that's been uncovered in the Bank of England by Forrest Cappy and people like that, 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 that the um, monetary authorities generally were captured at that time. They actually had imbibed rather this um, neoliberal ideology. They wanted to regulate by competition and that's where competition and credit control came from. And so there was a, I mean, that was just a little beginning in comparison to what happened later. And I agree um, that once banks saw that the um, authorities were, uh, were moving out of their formerly dominant position, that they made strenuous lobbying efforts and, and so on, and that has resulted in, in capture, and that's where we are now. But my perspective was historical. 